Right, yeah, the actual big, 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 big deal. Uh, so you've got Livent or Livent pronunciation. Uh, we did hear a bit of a social media strategy. If you mispronounce things deliberately, it gets you more views because people rag on you in the comments. So. Giving away all our tricks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we YouTube that YouTube trick. So Livent have proposing to merge with Alchem. So Livent is a New York Stock Exchange listed uh, $4.6 billion company. So that's $6.8 billion Aussie. Alchem, so Alchem are the product of a merger between Oracobra and Galaxy. So they're capped at Aussie $9.6 billion. So you'll know them for the Mount Catlin lithium deposit down in Ravensthorpe and they've also they've just had their James Bay project uh, approved after a five-year uh, five-year time frame in Quebec their big lithium deposit and they've also got other brine operations as well so big deal guys what's the go JD's gone deep into this and this is going to be a sensational insight, I reckon. Yeah, there were, there were a few fun ones to chuck around. So Livent or Livent, however you say that one, you could sort of say they're a bit early to the game. They were formed as Lithium Corp of America in 1944. So I quite like that one from the presentation. And like you highlighted, Manny, uh, both these companies have assets uh, spread out. So all came obviously with Mount Catlin in Australia. But the key... Uh, underpinnings of this deal are that the companies combined have assets both in Argentina and both in the in the same province in Canada. So the the deal sees all chem shareholders get 56% of Mergeco in an all script deal at an exchange ratio that sort of implies a 14% premium to the all chem price. So that's why we've seen all chem's share price up and I think it was at the last time we checked up 17% and you could see last night um, Livent were up 5% in America. So obviously the deal needs shareholder approval and court approval. They've only flagged for it to uh, wrap up at the end of this calendar year. And the outcome would be a company with a main New York Stock Exchange listing and a CDI listed down here. So really a, a North American business. It wouldn't really uh, be an American business anymore. And we'll, we'll tuck into that a bit more later on. Neither company has any major individual shareholders or any obvious blocking shareholders. They're the biggest shareholders for both of these companies are just passive funds. So don't expect anyone holding up the deal on that front. So both these companies, as you'd expect, are parading around the, the value creation and they flag annual cost synergies of 125 million per annum and CapEx expenditure savings of $200 million. So those CapEx savings, they really come from the shared infrastructure with the uh, Canadian assets, I think they might have flagged within 10 kilometres. No, Argentinian assets within 10 kilometres of one another and Quebec assets within 100 kilometres of one another, as well as those corporate costs. There'd be a, a bit of a restructuring and some people would be obviously leaving the boards and the management teams of both. So I think in this case, the the synergistic benefits, are they're, they're pretty real. Both these companies, like I just stressed, have assets in the, in the same jurisdiction. So there's lots of infrastructure that could sort of be saved in, in both processing and roads and so on. There was one other line that stood out to me in, in the announcement that flexibility to utilize feedstock from expanded asset portfolio to supply processing facilities. Now, I think this is pretty intriguing. I read this as the company being able to sort of flex whether it's producing more carbonate or whether it's producing more hydroxide to really just take value of what has whatever is being priced better at that moment. Right, Trav, what's it look like on a valuation standpoint, trading multiples? Mate, in, um, in M&A, they're always asking, is it accretive, is it accretive? And what, is, what, is, what does accretive mean? Uh, it just means, is the target trading at a lower multiple than the acquirer, in which case the acquirer um, sometimes benefits from their existing trading multiple applying to the, the earnings of the target. Um, in this case, Livent trades at a high multiple. They traded about 6.4 times, you know, FY25 EBITDA versus three times for Alchem. So it's, you know, obviously pretty accretive for Livent despite the implied 14% premium. Um, and on top of that, you know, you might even attract a higher multiple as a, as a merge co by virtue of the fact that you're now, you benefit from these enhanced vertical integrations and then that might actually result in some, you know, um, more durable um, margins and higher margins over time as well too. So this uh, mining M&A is absolutely just going off at the moment, isn't it? It is just relentless. Yeah, it's it's pretty unbelievable. And I don't think the the mainstream media are, are giving it enough time as, as it probably warrants. That's why we've we've 
come onto the scene. It's just we are the it's mainstream it's, media it's, now, JD. Yeah, you're seeing it more in in lithium now. We've seen it in nickel. We've seen it in copper. We're obviously seeing it in gold, like we spoke about earlier. It's it's just coming on stronger and stronger. And you you see it often. Firstly, start at the big end of town. So those those huge deals, you know, the Newcrest deal and so on. And then it often trickles its way over time down to to the smaller end of town. Every every mining cycle, there's some company pays top dollar for some something at you know the absolute top of the market. And in this case, like obviously lithium looks, um, it's, it's had an amazing run, right? But because this is an all script transaction, no one really reflects on this, you know, five years from now and and, and says someone looks silly because um, because you know it's all script. All right, here's a theory. I reckon it was COVID because COVID, the world realised that they didn't need everyone in an office. So I think a lot of companies have probably realised mass amounts of corporate costs that can be saved <laughs> by uniting. So there's Matty's theory for the day. Well, it's not all, it's not all, not all mining M&A is not um, – you should be dubious of the synergies, like especially when you've got these sort of downstream elements to it. I mean, I mean imagine if you combine downstream with upstream um, and capture – enhanced margin along the way they're real synergies other than just cutting corporate costs yeah that's that vertically integrated component that this this company is pretty big on now there are a few other notes that are jotted down that i thought were pretty interesting to talk about i think trav highlighted one earlier quite well is that pricing power so lithium is obviously contracted so it doesn't trade like you might see the copper price or the gold price trade and i think they flagged that from uh, earlier numbers, they had combined about 7% of the world's lithium production and that's going to grow over time and get bigger with, with the combined entities. And I think that'll give them pricing power down the track. So I think that's a really interesting angle. Uh, if you produce lithium products at the moment, one of your fears is going to be that your current margins are not going to stay as high as they are right now forever. And so what's one way you can protect those margins? It's actually to reduce the competitive dynamics in that market by consolidating with other peers. Um, and, and they emerge as what, the, the third largest? So, so you know, yeah. in, by doing that, they obviously have a pretty substantial competitive position. Um, and there's not like a huge field of players that are, are producing these products. So um, but they're reducing the, you know, the competitive dynamics in the market and hopefully have more pricing power when it comes to those contracts. Yeah, and I think that flows on nicely to the next point. Are these companies sort of preempting perhaps tougher times? So you just have to look at the lithium price chart over the past couple of years and you just see that ginormous spike up that we saw coming out of the COVID times. Free markets don't usually allow that sort of uh, profit margin to, to last too long. And I think it's especially true in a commodity business, but you still do have that delay with mines taking a while to get up and running. Well, so what happens to Mount Catlin? Mount Catlin, the... Uh Oh, a bit of a, we'll go into how they've uh, struggled with recovery over the previous couple of years, but what do you reckon happens with the Mount Catlin deposit? Yeah, there's a, there's a big reason why we circled this earlier. And if I was a investment banker, I'd be sort of circling around this one. I think it's really interesting. And it does seem like a bit of an afterthought when you look at the vertically integrated assets that they, they highlight in Argentina and in Canada, this one just doesn't, doesn't fit in that match and we'll flick up a chart that highlights that quite well. So like you sort of said, Maddie, that it hasn't been performing too well lately. They produced 39,000 tonnes of spodumene concentrate and that was at 5.2%. So I think you did a bit of digging on the, the recoveries they've been getting there. Well, there was, it was very well publicised they were mining, going through a lot of areas of the fine-grained spodumene. So when it's they talk about coarse grained and fine grained. So coarse grained is the good grain that it floats very easily, whereas if it's fine grained spodumene, so when they process it, they uh, have trouble actually floating it. So look, if you look at this chart, this is just Mount Catlin compared to Pilbara Minerals, Pilgangora. Um, you look at their recently, so last year, September 22, God, their recovery was 20, 26%. Um, and it started climbing back up. They had a better quarter last one. I think they were about 60. So you look at Pilbara Minerals, they sit around that. Uh, they only report their recovery annually. Uh, there was a mention last quarter, it was 60-odd percent, whereas they were sitting around 75%. So it shows how much the, the Mount Catlin mine's lo losing out the back end of the plant uh, due to the recovery. So... Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a, what the prediction going forward is there, but 
that was um, – you can see what they've lost over the last years back to the March 21 quarter. Yeah, and the resource estimate that they did in late 21 had 13.3 million tonnes at 1.2%. So given that was a couple of years ago – and that the NI43101 that they did highlighted just 3.8 years of mine life, that you think right now there's only about two years left of mine life this. So it sort of brings about the question, if they are looking to potentially get rid of this once the merger is done, who sort of picks up the asset? And just jotting down a few names of companies in the area, you've got Global Lithium, they might have their hands full trying to develop the MANA asset. They might not have the funding capability either. Exactly. IGO... And Minres is another name. So Minres has been active in the area. We saw them get involved in that essential deal just a couple of weeks back. So what do you guys reckon? Well, what are they going to buy? Like two years mine life and potential for exploration to, if they see more. But they, they wouldn't they, they'd take on a lot of um, rehabilitation and everything to buy the asset with a short mine life, wouldn't you think? Mm, yeah, it probably doesn't fit the, the portfolio of a Minres or an IGO unless – there are synergies with, with their other stuff, but it, it looks a bit too far away for any of that. And what about the the sort of state of the mill there? Mate, I hear it's um it's well I, I don't I don't I don't know too much, but I mean it is. Did near. you hear this at a pub, Trav? <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I did hear it at a pub. I heard at a pub that that mill could be potentially used at um at, at the nearby gold project that's un, undeveloped, but uh, that, that desperately needs mill and, and finds funding pretty 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 tough going at the moment. Oh, and the, and the pits, are, and we're talking about Medallion, um, we're, and the pits as well, all the infrastructure for like water water and tailing, tailing storage and stuff like that. So look, I know Medallion have had a bit of a uh, re, revision on their company journey of where they're heading with the, I think they're, pump it into the expiration now. Um, but uh, I think Mount Mount Catlin shutting down and u- utilising their infrastructure is a big, big key to the success of the development of Medallion. The longer lithium prices stay this high, the, yeah. the, the, you know, the further out in the future that becomes. Exactly. Yeah, I was just going to say with lithium prices this high, it doesn't matter how sort of high cost the operation is and it's not even that high cost. It's just low recovery, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, even, oh, God, even at... Uh, 26% recovery, they probably still made money. Mm-hmm. No, be, be shutting that down in, in this sort of market. So no. the last thing of note, guys, the company, they didn't highlight a uh, HQ. I'd imagine that'd be somewhere in North America and they didn't announce a name either. Any suggestions? I think, I think the name, you've got to merge the two words together. Alive. 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 Alive and alive fits the lithium thing. Live chem. Live chem. Live chem. Alive. Like alive. What about lick'em? <laughs> L-I-K-E-M. Lick'em. <laughs> <laughs>